or um, in other venues. So you may have observed something that you think is sufficient to comment on my performance. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. And that, I will say, on my part is really intentional. What I find is that um, no one binder fits all. And so different committee members are looking for information about different things. And it can feel kind of useless. Okay. So we'll talk about the due date some more when we figure out when our May school committee meeting is. All right. I I'm hope done. that you're done. Mr. Udall. Yes, thank you. How are you? Very good, thank you. Good. Um, I have a few more things to share about the kindergarten registration. Um, it was conducted on April 15th and 16th. Um, I want to commend Corey Feltovic, our secretary, who did a really great job of organizing and assisting parents with the process, um, getting all the necessary information to fully enroll the incoming kindergarten students. Um, that's not an easy task, and so um, you know, I, I greatly appreciate this undertaking and her efforts. Um, so although we had the registration on those days, uh, we're not limited. We obviously, uh, any, any parent or any resident of Hadley can come in and register. And so it's just a matter of coming, either contacting the school or coming in and, and uh, visiting the school uh, unannounced is fine too, to take care of that registration. Um, an MCAS recap for this year. Um, the LA testing is completed. It went smoothly. 100% of our grade three through six students who were eligible to participate have completed each of the sessions. Um, I want to thank the HES staff for their support. We have to be flexible with uh, rescheduling specials and moving things around to accommodate. Um, we have a large number of our staff beyond just the classroom teachers, paraprofessionals, special educators, uh, who also assist in the testing of students as well. So um, it is a, it's, it's a nicely orchestrated and an effective uh, process that we've been able to, to encourage here. Um, I'd like to thank the Hadley PTO again for providing the bottled water and the healthy snacks. And uh, Diane Choklis, uh, Kiris Choklis, who has been great about stepping up each year uh, to organize, contacting local businesses for donations, uh, and the PTO has just been so supportive. And she has come in each of the mornings at the elementary school to provide and distribute all of those snacks and water. So we're grateful for that as well. Um, we have the next uh, math session. Um, for grades three through six, plus the grade six, uh, excuse me, five science test will be taking place. That starts next week. It'll run, the window is May 4th to the 22nd. So we're gearing up for that right now. Uh, and the last thing I'd like to report on, which is not on the agenda, but I just would like to say something. Um, you know, Helping Hearts for Hadley Schools um, in the third annual event this year, it, it has just become such an incredible event. It is fun, it is family oriented, and community oriented, it's become hugely supportive, and it's for a great cause. Um, and I'd like to say to Stacy Mashinsky, who's the chairperson and the other executive members, they've done a tremendous job. It seems to be getting bigger and better each year. I understand, I don't know the exact numbers, um, but there were uh, 500 plus registered uh, participants who either did the 5K run, the 2K walk, um, and then a lot of people stayed for the many different activities that were part of the block party. It was a really fun day. We had perfect weather. Um, so Mother Nature cooperated for us for a change <laughs> this spring. And so I just want to say to them, thank you so much for their support because um, it's really well organized. And I think that the reason that it continues to grow in popularity is because of the efforts of the Helping Hearts for Hadley Schools committee and the, and the lengths that they go to to make it an appealing event. And so my hat is off to them and I'm proud to be a part as, as, as one of the volunteers and look forward to next year. So I wanted to add that as well. Thank and you. That completes my report for this month. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Okay. Questions? Thank you. No? Thank Ms. you. Wow. Good evening. So um, I had a little bit of news to share regarding our coordinated program review. Um, we have an orientation meeting scheduled tomorrow with a representative.
from the um, PQA office, and they will meet with um, administrators and plan their visit, which will take part in two different sessions. They'll come and review records uh, May 5th and 6th, and that is to go over um, we, additional information beyond what we've submitted last year, which is the bulk of what they review, but they want to always come and see something. We didn't have a chance to prepare, so we just have a sneak um, look in the drawers as well. Um, and then they'll be here for site visits um, the following week, the week of the 18th. Um, we will have interviews of several community members. Parents will be invited, um, staff members, administrators. will be a pretty widespread um, invitation to give opinions and reveal information to the committee. And then they go back and drop a report. It takes maybe five, six months sometimes to see that report, depending on our um, effectiveness on maintaining all that data and implementing regulations according to the standards, we'll get a report back with maybe some corrective actions or maybe just a good pat on the back to move forward as is. So we'll wait to see how that um, turns out. Um, you noticed in the personnel report that the staff that are coming and going are in special education. Um, we've hired the new teacher to run the, the Severe Needs Classroom. She started work last week, actually, came during her vacation and set up her classroom and met, um, did a site visit to an entering student's school um, so she could get a good peek at what we have to prepare for one of another challenging student. And she um, has been really excited the staff are very excited about having this classroom ready to roll and we're, we're hoping her experience will make a smooth transition for the kids that need that level of care um, we've also hired on the, yet to finalize but attracted um, <coughs> several applicants for a paraprofessional in that room we were looking for someone with very high qualifications, and we managed to find several and have chosen one who's moving up from Lyme, Connecticut. So she's willing to move to take uh, this position. So that seems to be a trend um, for our, our special education staff, and we're really proud that we have something worth moving for. Um, and the last thing that I can report out on is that we're beginning to pull in referrals for summer um, services and we will, will maintain the change in style of delivery that we had last year which is really dedicated to looking at IEP goals and the strategies needed to keep those kids from regressing over the summer and being very specific about those services so that's being um, gathered now in preparation for the summer to give a four to five week extended year to those kids that need it and that's about it. Yeah. Uh, when is the integrated class, the classroom starting? New well, it's uh, it's technically open today. Yes. <laughs> Sarah has spent um, <coughs> the morning actually visiting students in their mm -hmm. settings yeah. rather than just opening the doors. But she, because we are short-handed in one job today, the um, uh, shifting of personnel left her with a one-on-one -on -one student for the afternoon, <laughs> so she got to know him very quickly, and. Um, yeah, it's going to be a program with open doors to two or three immediately, right. and then as we adjust IEPs to meet their needs um, in a more thoughtful way, we will have more children integrated there. Thank you. Yeah, but it is up and running. I'm glad you told us it was going to be quick and smooth to hire someone. Well, we were really okay. lucky with our personnel <laughs> hiring. We were very lucky. So. Nicely done. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Beck. Um, I'd like to start off by saying a very special thank you to um, Susan Duncan in what I think was one of the most interesting, uh, in a good way, science fairs. I, I know sometimes when people oh, yes. use the word interesting, they're <laughs> implying something. Uh, in this particular case, um, Susan Duncan and her helper, uh, uh, Mike Burgess, uh, really have done a phenomenal job of transitioning seventh graders, you know, from a, a really strong experience, um, sixth graders coming into mm -hmm. the high school and having them have such a profound project-based learning experience that takes place over the course of the year. And they've done a really nice job of weaving in 
um, project management, time management, uh, executive functioning skills, and study skills uh, in the curriculum uh, for all of the seventh graders this year. And so uh, I'm very pleased with what they've done. Um, I wanted to also congratulate Virginia Canella and Matthew Weber, and as an in, uh, who qualified for regionals as grand champions of this particular science fair. But um, there are standards for regional qualification, and I'm, I'm very proud on Susan's behalf to say that almost half of the seventh grade graduating class qualified uh, for regionals at MCLA this Saturday. So that's, that's awesome. 22 total students with um, Virginia and Matthew being crowned as grand champions of this <laughs> school. So they still have a shot to do something uh, a little bit further down the road. But thank you very much to Susan. Um, I also wanted to congratulate <clears throat> Mary Cook and Drew Castronovo, Hawkins Academy seniors who were selected as um, this year's recipient of the McDonald's Scholar Athlete Award. Um, the reason I wanted to mention it is they and their families have been invited to a dinner on May 6th at the Basketball Hall of Fame, and it ends up being a very nice event um, for the students and their families. <clears throat> I'd like to also echo um, Jeff's sentiments um, regarding the day we had a pretty significant number of Hopkins students who participated in the road race, um, and I had no idea that these kids were runners. I don't think that they necessarily did either, but I was pleasantly surprised at how well these students performed in the race, especially considering you know uh, cross country for next fall uh, as a potential sport. Um, it was interesting considering how many of the, the Hopkins students and the elementary students who participated who were not in it to participate there was a lot of smack talk that went on, and they were going to win the race. <laughs> Even in my own family, my sixth grade son taunted my wife for the entire race until, and, and he, she didn't, she just didn't think he was going to be able to keep up with them, and he beat her. So, um, but special thanks to the, all of those people seeing it sort of from beginning to end this year, <clears throat> um, and all of the behind the scenes work that's done by Stacy and, and her minions. Um, the work is just exceptional. The fact that they kept everything organized from last year, uh, the community support that they've built. Um, last year's funding was um, almost all of the work is complete between the combination of the Helping Hearts um, funding that came from last year's race, uh, when combined with the traditional funding that we received, you know, they've, the Helping Hearts Group has created this unique confluence of um, 351 years of tradition um, that provides funding for our kids in terms of, uh, from the Board of Trustees. <clears throat> um, when we combined all of those resources together, um, our tech director, Mike Duffy, is nearly completed on projects to either update or install um, audio, visual, and pro projection technology in 10 classrooms in the building. And it will ultimately impact several other classrooms because um, other boards are still functional. There are some teachers who are more technologically proficient who had specific requests for more complicated technology, um, <clears throat> but their more simplistic educational technology can be moved to other classrooms. So um, also wanted to thank the Board of Trustees that as seniors are in the process of applying um, for their scholarships this year, that um, they're, going, they're doing their applications in the Navion system, which was purchased by the Board of Trustees. Uh, I wanted to say thank you also to Guidance Director Angie Cullinan and our Administrative Assistant Caitlin Lord, who got the Navion system up and running, and um, Angie has implemented her guidance curriculum for all students in grades 9 through 12 during the course of this year, has introduced every student to the system, <clears throat> and it really has changed the tone of the conversation, and I think the biggest thing has been just sort of getting students focused on that process earlier on has helped to alleviate some tension that hopefully they won't feel quite so stressed out as many kids do when they're seniors and it will be a little bit more fun. I think in some cases for seniors it's just the pressure of their parents not wanting them to go too, too far away. Like no foreign countries. <laughs> um, I also wanted to say thanks to the Board of Trustees. Uh, it, it, in our MCAS update, <clears throat> um, we had 99% participation of the 141 students who participated in, in the ELA exams between 7, 8, and 10. Uh, we had two students who were exempted between those three grades um, with legitimate reasons. And um, 
The Board of Trustees provided all of those students in those grades with both breakfast on those days as well as a, a snack uh, during the course of the testing. So thank you very much to the Board of Trustees for all they do. Going back to the field trip piece uh, and that science fair, um, congratulations uh, to Susan and to the students. The Board of Trustees also provided a fund this year uh, for Ms. Duncan to be able to extend resources to students mm -hmm. who didn't otherwise have the resources. And rather than waiting for students to come forward, it was really easy to be able to, for uh, Mr. Burgess and Ms. Duncan, to easily identify those students, um, you know, just in, in casual conversation um, yeah. with them very discreetly and get them the resources that they needed. And I think that ultimately paid off in the number of students who qualified for regionals. So it's not just getting the funding, but the fact that our teachers are doing something really amazing with what they're getting. Um, I'm hoping never to walk uh, the fields when we get our new archery supplies. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also wanted to say thank you to Helping Hearts for the archery supplies, the document camera for the social studies department, and uh, the, project the contributions that they made to the projection technology. Um, in particular, if you have the opportunity to see what uh, Mr. Duffy uh, Helping Hearts, Mr. Duffy and Steve Saluzio did to reconfigure the biology lab. It's really a state-of-the-art uh, facility for that particular content area. So, mm -hmm. you know, thank you very much to Steve for his expertise in bringing that along. <clears throat> Coming up, um, there's a huge list of events, and I'm not going to read every one of them, but beginning next Monday, May is testing month at, uh, in most high schools in Massachusetts. That I, you know, there's. An enormous amount of time that's taken up by these exams, but all of these exams serve our students ultimately really well. But coming up this month, we'll have advanced placement tests in chemistry, calculus, literature and composition, modern European history, biology, Spanish, and language and composition, um, with nearly 100 students taking exams in, in those content areas. I'm sorry, nearly 80 students taking exams in those content areas. Um, this Friday, the seventh grade visits the Boston Aquarium and MIT. Uh, Saturday, of course, is the Regional Science Fair. The Hopkins Academy Spring Concert is going to be held on Saturday, May 9th. And uh, Mr. Burns has put together a student council trivia night uh, as a fundraiser <laughs> for student council, which would like to do a little bit more in terms of bringing events to the school uh, after taking over the memorial, uh, sorry, the Veterans Day ceremony and pulling the community in, they would like to be able to have some resources to pull in guest speakers or other events that might come into the school. And so this is a great way for student council uh, to begin a fundraising process and, you know, again, pull the community together. So that's going to be on uh, May 23rd from 5 to 10 p.m. And an email will go out to folks, uh, to families to let them know. Um, May 26th and 27th will be the 8th grade trip to Boston. And our MCAS tests begin the second week of May with the 8th um, grade taking their science exams. And then the following week, um, the 7th, 8th, and 10th grade will all take math, the LA, I'm sorry, uh, the math MCAS exams. Uh, the last day of classes for seniors is Friday, May 29th. Uh, with the prom being held at the Delaney House uh, that Saturday, May 30th. And then um, the following week is Senior Week, and there are a number of events that are planned. These dates, um, although the dates that are, are locked in, the times are tentative as they're working with um, the venues to just lock down a very specific time. So in putting the date in, I put the times from last year, assuming that it would be similar. But those dates will be sent out to senior families as well as given to seniors in hand, or the times, rather. Um, and I think that's it for Hopkins Academy, unless anybody has questions. Graduation is June 5th? Graduation is June 5th. Thank you. Thank you for that. Questions for Mr. Beck? <coughs> At what point in the senior week do I start crying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, certainly by senior night. Probably, yeah. 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 <laughs> and we move on to Chris, the business manager's report. Okay, we have a number of items today. First is the Hopkins Library update. So we had all kinds of I don't even remember when it happened. So was it after the last meeting? 
chapter, yes. I think. Okay. After the last no, meeting. No, it's before the last meeting. The I library? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I must have at least mentioned it to you at the last meeting. Oh, I thought that was the insurance for the, uh, for the furnace. It's been quite a year. Yes, it has. <laughs> First of all, the furnace, uh, the water heater, excuse me, has been covered. We have not received the money yet. They asked for a more detailed bill. But once they receive that bill, I think it's going to be split between two insurance companies. And therefore, that was the request for a more detailed breakdown, which I received over the weekend and then sent back a request today for a more detailed bill again because all it did was listed more stuff that they did, but the price was still just a bottom line price. And obviously, the insurance companies are going to need pricing to split it up. So at least that's some good news. Uh, we got that covered. We had an adjuster come in to the library. He looked it over. We've done a number of things in there. Um, air quality testing was performed, I think, on Friday. Um, it was performed a couple of times, but with the moisture in there and the tearing down of the ceiling with all the dust it created, we needed to really just let things settle out. And now that that's been done, the carpet has been cleaned and they feel confident that their tests will come back with no problems whatsoever. Um, so the librarian will be going through books, looking for any damaged books. We were told to just put them on a table, take inventory of them, and I'm assuming we can just dispose of them, although I did tell her we'll probably hold on to them until we have a check in hand. Um, so she's going to be doing that as soon as the results of the air quality test come back. And do we have any sense of what percent of books were damaged? One to two, oh, I guess, just based well, on looking. That's good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's an absolute guess, but yeah. but no, it but seems, not seventy. Oh no, no. no. Yeah. It seems that the books that were on their sides, maybe too tall for the shelves, were damaged much more than the books that were standing up straight. I don't know why, because that roof was so steamy. Um, you would have thought it would have gotten into everything, but um, there were things on the wall. Uh, there was an aerial picture of Hopkins Academy. That's just a big, wavy, mm -hmm. ruined mess at this point. So I told her again, inventory all of that. It can all be replaced at some point. The doors were, I don't know what happened with the doors. I think all the, the polyurethane on the doors just kind of melted off or something. I mean, they were, they were like a chalky mess, really, on the doors. So we need to just get in touch with the adjuster and find out if he wants it to replace the doors or just refinish. Um, as I mentioned, the heating units, again, it was like this white film over everything. So they need to be gone through. Um, and uh, that will be done as well. Um, when did they expect the library to be operational again? Um, well, let's see. Let's see. <laughs> Fridays. Monday the 4th is okay. when students, now that's not going to be finished, right, um, right. but it will be to the point of where students can get in and use it again. I'm guessing that the work will probably be done over the summer, right. um, yeah. just because of the fact that I guess with some of the glues that they're going to be using, um, <clears throat> laminating countertops and stuff again that just lifted right off, um, there's quite a, an odor to the glues. so. They said it would just kind of make its way through the whole building, even if we have the windows open. So it might just work out better you know, when the students are gone. Um, and that's that's really pretty much it from the library standpoint. There's not really a heck of a lot more, um, you know, to update you on at this point in time. Um, Chris, I just want to underscore that there was an air quality test done. Everything came back fine, and we anticipate it'll even be better at this next air quality test. So yes. just want to make sure that that and was And they clear. did a test for asbestos as well, yes. actually. That came back negative. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, this was kind of like a, a second air quality mm -hmm. test, really, just after the dust had settled, more or less. Um, and, yeah, then we, nothing came back with the first one, so they don't anticipate anything coming back with this one either. But. Mm -hmm. So they're testing molds and that as well? They've already done that, yes. Yep. So next we have the expense report. Um, let's see, we have a couple of items I just wanted to point out. The school choice transfers were done, which accounts for we have a balance, of an available balance in the teacher salary lines. Last month we had the $2,500 difference. I don't really know if we had covered all the funds, but apparently missed $2,500 in each account. 
Um, so you can see what we have available still in those accounts. Also, the professional development line with about $94,000. Um, that is used to pay for the five professional development, excuse me, development days throughout the year. So I will be transferring expenses from the salary lines into that line next week, um, or actually this week now. Um, so those, uh, that again will be zeroed out. There are a few accounts with some negative balances in here. Most of those were addressed by transfers that I did last Friday. Um, there are a few more that we will do next month. They will require, most all of the transfers I've done so far did not require school committee approval. As long as I can transfer within like accounts, we're good. Um, but unfortunately, these accounts were some that I had nothing in a like account that had an available balance, so I will need to bring them forward to you just for your approval before I do the transfers. Um, so again, those will be in your next meeting package and then we can do them right after that. Uh, let's see, we had, just last week was it that we had the spending freeze? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we just froze spending. Um, what happens, and, and you know well last summer when I kept bringing forward bills, um, it's kind of just a, a habit of Hadley more or less where sometimes things are purchased without prior approval, um, you know, the process should be... We are fixing that habit. We are. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, for the record, that habit is being fixed. It will be fixed. Yes. Um, and, and what happens is all of a sudden we'll get a bill, and we weren't, it was not approved yet. So that makes it really difficult if we go right up until the end of the year, and then all of a sudden these bills are coming in that we weren't prepared for. So we've just in instituted this spending freeze. As I said to Annie, we'll just let the dust settle let these things come forward, and there have been a couple already that have come forward. So, um, and then we can kind of reevaluate toward the end of the year to see where we stand on these things. Um, so, at this point in time, I don't really anticipate any problems in terms of, you know, available funding to uh, finish out the year. And again, we won't be um, returning any money because we've done transfers to and from revolving type accounts like Circuit Breaker um, that I could always transfer expenses back um, you know, from there to the local budget. So we're, we're good as far as that goes as well. And really, carrying forward extra Circuit Breaker money certainly would never hurt anything. So you know, it's, it's great to have it more or less in the bank for next year. So uh, we will do that. So that's about it for expenses, really. You know, as far as things I need to point out, I don't know if you have any questions on those. Okay, um, next we have the revolving account report. Um, not really much to point out here. We had another little uptick in the, well, I guess less of a down section. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it's looking good. In the yeah. school lunch account. I mean, it's coming back. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's always good news to see. What I'll probably do again is look for any kind of repair type expenses that they've done throughout the year and transfer those to the school budget and that will help mm -hmm. bring the account back because we can't go forward into next year with it in a negative balance. So um, as you can see, we had that whopping $95 balance on June 30th, but at least it was a positive balance. Um, preschool revolving, you can see we, we went up quite a bit. That was really just a result. We had a, um, some movement in the preschool staffing and we kind of just waited again for that to settle out before we transferred the expenses. Um, we had them all going to the preschool revolving account. We transferred them back into the regular school budget. So that's why you see such a big uptick there. Uh, student activity, you see a, a big drop. Again, this is the kind of the time of year really where just the big items are being paid for, and uh, and so you know that's a result of it. So basically, that is it on the revolving accounts. Unless anyone has any questions. No? Okay. Chris, just can you give me an example of like what's been spent in the student account? Um, bigger field trips that they have. I, I, did they have a, an overseas trip? Mm -hmm. So, the right, bus. so student activities right. that would help to support any student activity, like a bus trip or bus transportation to the airport, for example. Student activity fund is a proprietary fund. It can only be used for and by students specifically for the activities that it was raised for. Mm -hmm. We cannot transfer money out of a student activities count and use it for any sort of operational expense. The um, That's true of the student activities. The other accounts you see on the revolving account are 
Um, not all. Athletics wouldn't be. Well, maybe it would be. What's that? An enterprise. No. It's just a just a revolving fund. And yeah. the other two, lunch and preschool, um, operate like enterprise funds, meaning that the fees that we collect should sustain the programs. Um, and as Chris pointed out, most lunch programs across the Commonwealth, they cannot, they don't collect enough in lunch revenue to take care of repairs and the purchasing of, of equipment. So that's when we start operating things out of the operating budget. And when you look at your operating budget for FY16, you'll see food services is all zeroed out there. We treat it like an enterprise fund and then when it's necessary,